takes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in all and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing love. coming out to be with us at Twickenham today. If you are a guest, we are honored that you've come to be with us. And if uh, you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. Love to invite you to join us on this journey. We are just trying to figure out how to be disciples of Jesus Christ in this culture at this time. And it's not always an easy thing to figure out how to do. We don't have all the answers on that. But we're just trying to make our way together, and we'd love for you to join us in that journey. There is a card in the back of the pew in front of you that looks like this. Uh, if you are a guest today, we'd appreciate it if you would just drop us a note here. Let us know about your visit with us and uh, some information about you. We'd love to send you uh, some information about us. If you have prayer requests, you can indicate that on the card, and we'll be praying about those this week. If you want the whole church to pray about it, just put it on there. If you want it kept private for just our staff and shepherds, then uh, just indicate private and we'll, we'll make sure that we hold that in confidence. But we're just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. There is another card that you uh, would have seen in the morning program. And it's a card that says going to church is only half of it. We need to be loving others by volunteering. There's an opportunity for you and we've been talking about this, about, you know, we, we're not just attenders. We are a part of this body, a part of this church, and we've all got a gift to use. And we'll be talking more about that in a few weeks. Um, but we, we need to be active in serving one another. This, this is a great opportunity for you to do that, specifically through our Twickenham Children's Ministry, TCM. And Amy has in, uh, given you some opportunities to indicate your name, uh, your email and phone number, and then an area where you would like to serve. 
So if you would like to go to heaven when you die, <laughs> then you need to put all your hope and confidence and faith in Jesus Christ, all right? Because that's the only thing that's going to get you there. But if you want the express ticket, this is it, okay, right here. So if you, no, seriously, if you've been looking for a way to get involved, this may be it, okay? Putting your name down on this doesn't mean that you're automatically conscripted or drafted, but we will contact you, and if you have questions about how to serve and what this looks like, Amy will be glad to answer those. Just indicate your interest on this. You can put this in the collection plate when it passes later on, and if you put one of these in the collection plate, you feel free to take some money out, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't count. So, hey, let's stand together. I want you to hear a passage of Scripture with me as we get started. I'm kidding about that take money out part, you know, right? <laughs> it's so not true. This is uh, from Hebrews chapter 10, awesome passage about the assurance we have in Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body and since we have a great high priest over the house of God let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings that's what we have because of Jesus let's praise him for that Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending ring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Built with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Lay your burden down, every care you carry. And come to the table of grace, for there is mercy. Just as you are, we are all unworthy to enter the presence of God, for He is holy. Lift up your heart, lift up your hands, fall on your knees and pray for the King.
For he is holy. Jesus says in Matthew 6, this then is how you should pray. Would you join me as we pray together for Matthew 6? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin 
and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you, do- are you going to wash my feet? You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Will you bow with me? Dear God, we come to you with open arms and humble hearts, ready to receive you. God, we thank you for sending your son and breaking his body for us. God, we are humbled by you and everything you have done for us. We thank you for your son and for this bread we are about to take, and we pray in his name. Amen. The wine and the bread and the sons of the earth, how beautiful the feet that walk, the long dusty roads and the hill to the cross, how beautiful is the body. Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, 
No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this uh, time of communion that you've given us. I, I thank you for the, this example that you've given us of washing each other's feet and, and cleansing um, each other's lives. Uh, I pray that this cup would be blessed to us. Uh, I thank you for your son that's died for us. Uh, amen. This is my worship, lifted up to you, the Holy One of Heaven, the Worthy Lamb of God. Please hear my cry for mercy, I come humbly to your throne, and offer up my life to you.
introduce some folks to you here. This is Blake Boggs. This is Ellen Horton. Every year, we uh, bring in, we, we love our teenagers very much. And we had a great youth group, and we love Shelby and Jesse, our youth ministers. They do a great job. And so every year, we bring in some interns to help with uh, working with our kids. It's good for the kids. It's good for the interns. It's good for Shelby and Jesse. It's good for our church. And it's particularly good because uh, Blake is uh, from Atlanta. <laughs> He's a Georgia fan. <laughs> this is a true Israelite in whom is no guile. <laughs> right here. And Ellen, Ellen, where are you from? Here. <laughs> She's one of ours. She grew up here. And so we just wanted to have a prayer with them and just bless their time with us. We're, we're thrilled they're here. They're going to do a great job, and uh, we just want to bless them with a prayer here. Let's pray together. Holy Father, thank you for Blake and Ellen and for their willingness to join us this summer. We love our, we love our kids. It's a great group of young people you've blessed us with. They're strong in the Lord, and um, they're loving, and they're welcoming. And they got a hard road to hope. It's hard to be a teenager in this culture, and so we're thankful that Blake and Ellen are going to join us to serve, to lead, to bless. We ask your blessings on them. Give them great wisdom as they use their gifts in service here. Bless them with safety and all the traveling that they do with their kids. Bless them with your spirit in a full measure so that they will be conduits of your grace and mercy and wisdom all summer long. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Hey, give them a hand. We're glad they're here. Now, I, I, you know this, but I, it's just a good thing for you to hear me say every now and then. You know that there's great potential that I'm wrong about stuff sometimes, right? You know that, right? And then some things I'm never wrong about. So. But, and, and when I get up here and I, and I, I teach stuff, I, re, I believe it's true. And I've, you know, I've done work on it and I've thought about it and prayed about it and I believe that what I teach is true. But you, you just, you know that the possibility is that I can be wrong, right? So I just, I wanted to say that. I don't think I'm wrong about anything I'm going to say today. But some of you will probably think that. Okay? And that's okay. We're all going to the Word to try to find the truth, and we believe that's where the truth is. We don't think the truth is in us, because, you know, uh, that's kind of the cultural thing. Whatever is true is what I think, and I think we have to go to this standard. We don't, we're not always going to agree on that. So I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 5, okay? And I'm going to tell you up front that a lot of us are not going to like this passage. This is one of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, misused, mangled, misrepresented, misjudged, mismanaged, maligned, and literally manhandled verses in the Bible. Skeptics use this passage to prove that the Bible is a misogynist document and that God hates women. Misogynists use this to justify their treatment of women. A lot of women resent it a lot of men are absolutely terrified of it. And I'll, if you pull it out of its historical and biblical context, it really does sound like something the Taliban would say. But when you permit the historical and biblical and literary context to inform your interpretation and application of this passage, it becomes not, not oppressive, but empowering. So, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're just going to we're going to start just by reading the passage and getting it out there in front of us in all of its offensive glory. All right, and then we're going to talk about why is this so offensive. We'll we'll talk about that. And after that, I want to give you some historical background so that you can get a sense for how these words would have been heard when the Apostle Paul first wrote them. How, how did the people who first hear these words respond to them? And then finally, I'm going to give us three handles 
on how to apply this passage in our context. Now, that sounds like a long time. We'll take a bathroom break every couple of hours, so you should be all right, okay? All right. And let me say a word here, too. This is about marriage. This has got powerful teaching. If you're widowed, divorced, single, young, there's, there's a lot of really good stuff here, really deep theological important stuff, regardless of your marital status, okay? So en- engage with it all the way through. All right, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. Here we go. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So, as we, as we look at this, as we hear that, we, a really good place for us just to start is what why are these lines so hard for so many of us to hear, and and even for Christians? I mean, for a lot of us, this is just a really embarrassing passage. I mean, come on, that's not how we do things these days. We kind of wish it it wasn't really in here. So why, why do we feel that way? Why is this offensive? Why is it hard to hear? Why does it rub us the wrong way? I actually think that there's a video, that a, a commercial that's on television right now that will really help explain why we find these lines expensive. Watch this, watch this video. What's it like to be the boss of you? Pretty great. How about a 10% raise? How about 20? How about done? That's the kind of control I like. And that's what they give me at National Car Rental. I can choose any car in the aisle I want without having to ask anyone. Who better to be the boss of you than me? I mean, you. Us. Go national. Go like a pro. So, I'm not endorsing national car rental, and nothing I say is necessarily they're going to agree with, okay? So, but that, I think that's your answer of why we find these lines so offensive. What, what's it like to be the boss of you? It's pretty great. Who better to be the boss of you than you? That's why it's hard to hear these verses. There is a cultural cuss word right at the very beginning of this section in verse 21, submit, and it's aimed at everybody in Paul's audience, the women, the men, the children, everybody is called to submit, and we don't like that. We don't like the idea of submission. If you submit, that means that somebody else is the boss of you. It means that you don't have the freedom of self-determination. Somebody else is deciding for you, and that's just not how it's done these days. We have Pandora Radio. 
You, this is their tagline. Play only the music you love. We fly Korean Air, where it's all about you. For years, Microsoft asked us, where do you want to go today? And L'Oreal is expensive, but hey, you're worth it. It is no wonder that the most iconic image of our age is the selfie. But now this is not a new phenomenon. Even from a, from a great historical distance, it's often difficult to pinpoint when a cultural movement began. But I've been doing a lot of research, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think I've figured it out. I think that the year 1974 may be the moment when a major shift occurred in American culture. Now, the 1960s certainly set it up, but 1974 was the year when we threw off a particular kind of tyranny and finally embraced our potential as individuals with the power to determine for ourselves what we wanted out of life. No longer were we willing to meekly accept what was offered. We wanted freedom. We wanted options. We wanted what we wanted. The tyranny that we threw off was best represented by this clown, Ronald McDonald. Because in the early part of the 1970s, McDonald's success, they, they were the, 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 by far the dominant fast food provider, and their success was due in large measure to the fact that they mass-produced hamburgers, and you didn't get a choice. Their hamburgers all came one way, and then something magical happened. Burger King. Have it your way, have it your way, have it your way. Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Oh, well, in that case, could I have the other Whopper with extra ketchup? Sure. We can serve your grilled beef Whopper fresh with everything on top of any way you way. Now that's the way to do things, our way. Have it your way, have it your way, at Burger King, with Burger King. When I was a kid, <laughs> we had to watch commercials like that, in the snow, uphill both ways. <laughs> You're lucky. Okay. Every time you pass a Burger King, you're going to remember this, okay? Here's the, look, I don't think Burger King turned us into egomaniacs. They didn't. I think somebody there recognized something about human nature, and they capitalized on it because we were already there long before 1974. Truthfully, I, and I, I really think this, I think somebody in Burger King's marketing department had been reading the Bible and realized that it was telling the truth about human beings. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God, did God really say, you must not eat from the tree and the trees in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we can eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Satan said to the woman. Because God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Forget the fruit. It's not about the fruit. This temptation is about becoming the boss. This temptation was about being like God, knowing good and evil, 
at being able to set your own rules, to decide what's good for you, what's right for you, to mark out your own boundaries, to determine your own destiny, to have it your way, to be the boss of you. In his book, New Morning Mercies, Paul David Tripp tells us a a really uncomfortable truth about ourselves. He says, "We we don't like boundaries. We tend not to esteem rules. We don't like to be told what to do. We don't love authority. We want to author our own moral codes. I want to have it my way. You want to have it your way. We, we all, every one of us, and this is why I said at the very beginning that if you're married or not, this has got great practical truth for you here. We all, every one of us, want to live a Burger King ethic. We want to be the boss of us. I want to be the boss of me. Russell Moore is president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. In a recent article, he wrote, we chafe against having ourselves defined by a creator and not by ourselves or our ideologies. Not only do do I want the freedom of self-determination, I want the freedom of self-definition. I want to say who I am, I want to say how I live, and I want you to accept it, which sounds awesome, until six billion people try it all at once. The Apostle Paul actually addresses this feature of human nature in the book of Ephesians, which is the book that we've been exploring over the last many weeks in this series called Identity, Who We Really Are in Christ. Chapter 2. If you're a big fan of self-determination and self-definition, you're probably not going to like what Paul says here. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time. All right, here it is. All right, here's the self-determination, the self-definition that he's talking about. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. We were self-determining and self-defining. We bought into what David Brooks, in his book, uh, The Road to Character, calls the gospel of self-trust. I know what's good for me. I know what I need to do and what I, what's good, what's good, what's bad for me. I get to make those decisions. We bought into that self-determining, self-defining gospel of self-trust, and it was killing us. It was killing our souls. Verse 4, Paul says there's some good news. But because, this is Ephesians 2, 4, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. You didn't save yourself. It says it again in verse 8. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, not by self-determination, not by self-definition, not by self-righteousness, so that no one can boast, because we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That right there, I think, is the most important thing in the book of Ephesians. The good that we do is a result of our salvation, not the reason for it. We are given a new identity, a fresh start, a holy purpose, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. As a result of what God has done in Jesus, everything everywhere in our lives is different. Our relationships with other Christians are characterized by love and service and unity. We resolve conflicts quickly. We speak to each other truthfully. We use our words to encourage, not attack. We exercise kindness, compassion, forgiveness. We don't accumulate and hoard possessions, and we don't envy and take them. We share them with those in need. And it's absolutely critical to remember that these responses to people and to possessions are a result, 
a consequence of what God has done for us in Christ. They are not the means by which we are forgiven and saved. They are the result of our salvation. This is how saved people live. This is not how people get saved. That's critical. The submission Paul calls us to when he says, submit to one another, wives to your husbands and husbands to your wives, and later on he'll say children to your parents. The submission he calls us to is based in what Christ has done. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, as I said, a lot of folks these days, those words are deeply, deeply offensive. And we've talked about why that is, because nobody wants, you know, I want to be the boss. What may be surprising is that those words were, ju- were, were just as offensive when they were first written down, but for different reasons. So, like, I know why I'm offended by these words. I want to be the boss of me. Truth is, I want to be the boss of you. That's what I really, that's what I really want. But why were they offended? If, 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 it's, if, it's, if I'm right, that these people would have been just as offended. Paul's first readers were just as offended. Why? Let me give you some historical background. In the world of Paul's readers, women had none of the rights that we take for granted today. They could not vote. They could not testify in court. They could not hold public office. They could not buy or sell property without the consent and presence of a male relative. They were subject to their fathers until they were given in marriage to their husbands, at which time they were considered the property of their husbands. Once married, the wife was expected to take not just the name, but the religion of her husband. That's why Paul, um, oh man, I should have looked this up. Where is it that Paul, see I told you I wasn't always going to be right about stuff. Paul talks to wives who are married to unbelievers and he counsels them on how to respond in that circumstance. It was an expectation that the wife would take her husband's gods. Her, Her role was to bear children, manage the household. Fidelity to her husband was expected, but there was no such expectation for the husband to his wife. In fact, it was assumed that husbands would seek the company of courtesans. Under Roman law, women could divorce, but the husband always retained custody of the children and all assets, and the wife, once divorced, was remanded back to her father's authority. So when Paul begins this section on the family by calling for mutual submission, it would have been received as a radically different arrangement. The very fact that he addresses the women, that that he speaks to them, is surprising because had a non-Christian philosopher written these words, he would not have said, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. He would have said something like, husbands, subject your wives. But Paul addresses the wives as equals who have the power to decide whether or not they're going to obey this command. The thing I want you to see is that Paul's words here were deeply offensive to that culture, not because they were perceived as archaic and oppressive, but because they were new and liberating. And it had been that way for centuries, centuries before Aristotle believed that women were inferior to men. He said, this is Aristotle, right? Woman, he said, is a deformed male. Plato said, it is only males who were created directly by the gods and given souls. Thales, a lot of you engineers out there know this guy, the first Greek mathematician, thanked fortune that he had been born a man, not a woman. You contrast what had been the prevailing attitude toward women to that of Jesus. Dorothy Sayer, in her book, Are Women Human?, writes this about Jesus. She says, perhaps it is no wonder that women were the first at the cradle and the last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There had never been such another, a prophet and teacher who never nagged them, who never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made arch jokes about them, who never treated them as the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without querulousness and praised without condescension, 
who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and was completely unselfconscious. Paul, in submission to Jesus, followed his master's ethic regarding women as equals. Unfortunately, and this is a thing that we must confess, other significant leaders in church history were not as faithful to Jesus. Some of the great names, some of the fathers in, in our history, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Augustine, Martin Luther, many others were just wrong, wrong about women. And in their commentaries on this passage, wrong about its meaning. Their interpretations of Scripture were influenced by a patriarchal culture, and which is a, a warning for us. If we're honest, our interpretations of Scripture are just as susceptible to cultural influence, so we must always be careful. So what, what do these words here in Ephesians chapter 5 mean for us? What, what, what do we do with them? Let me give you three takeaways. Here's the first one. These verses are not about human hierarchies. They are about humble submission of husbands and wives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is not about human hierarchy. This is about humble submission to Jesus. This passage is most definitely about who's the boss in your marriage. But the boss doesn't wear the pants. And the boss doesn't wear a dress. The boss wears a crown of thorns. The command to submit to one another is the marriage application of that prayer we prayed earlier in this service. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In fact, I think it would be a good thing if husbands and wives prayed together a marriage-specific version of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done in our marriage as it is in heaven. A, Christian's wife, a Christian wife's respect for her husband is a part of her submission to Jesus. I think that's what as to the Lord means in verse 22. A Christian husband's sacrificial love for his wife is a part of his submission to Jesus. I understand that the issues we struggle with in our marriages are awfully deeply complex and tangled into exquisite knots. But I am convinced that a large percentage of our problems would at least be softened, if not completely solved, if every wife and every husband first focused on his or her personal submission to Jesus Christ. Let me, let me say a word to you guys for a second, our, our teenagers. You, you may not even be thinking about this right now, about marriage, but you will be one day. As you, as you think about dating and marriage, I want to strongly encourage you to marry someone who is committed to Jesus Christ. Marry a Christian. It, it, marriage, uh, marriage is hard, okay? It's just hard. It, it's going to be a lot harder if you are trying to walk with someone who is marching to the beat of a different drum, one other than Jesus. So I just want, young sisters, no man is going to love you the way a man who is totally committed to Jesus Christ will love you. And guys, no woman will ever respect you the way a woman who is totally committed to Jesus Christ will respect you. I just, I just want to say that. I don't know if you ever hear that. I wanted you to hear it in your church. I think that's an important thing for, for you to think about. Okay, second thing. Here's the second takeaway from this passage. These verses teach the complementary nature of marriage. And I'm using the word complementary as a synonym of reciprocal or mutual. You see that very clearly down in verse 31 where Paul quotes Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The husband and wife are a part of a relationship that is so complementary, so mutual, so reciprocal that it can be referred to as one flesh. You also see the complementary nature of marriage in the specific instructions Paul gives to both. 
The wife is to submit to and respect her husband. The husband is to love and serve his wife. Both the husband and the wife are called to make sacrifices for each other. Some years ago, I heard Charles Swindoll say it this way, the wife is to live for her husband, the husband is to die for his wife. Somebody else said the wife is to give in to her husband, the husband is to give up to his wife. There's an old Jewish saying summarizing the Torah's teaching on how husbands are to treat their wives. Treat your wife like a queen and she will treat you like a king. Treat your wife like a slave and she will show you who is boss. I saw a really beautiful illustration of this complimentary kind of experience this past week. I did not ask them for permission to tell this story because I thought it would be good for them to have the opportunity to practice forgiveness. So, <laughs> Nell Noblet had shoulder surgery this past week. And I went, I went to pray with her before her surgery. And so I went into the, the room there and I knelt down beside her bed. And I always try to say something to kind of relax people. And, and if they've already had the medicine, it doesn't matter. But if they haven't had the medicine, I try to say something to relax them. And so I said, hey, Nell, I want you to think about something. You're going to be in a sling for a month, six weeks. And if you really milk it, maybe two months you can get whatever you want out of Bob. Anything you want, you got. You can just milk it. You like, you're going to be like queen. I'm going to tell you what she said. This is, this is a verbatim quote. Oh, he already treats me like a queen. Why, with Bob, every morning is Christmas morning. So I looked at the label on her arm to make sure I was in the right room because <laughs> I, I know Bob right? I was one of those guys with a, it's got like a gruff exterior covering up a gruff interior. So I was like, am I in the right room? But she was sincere. She said, he treats me like a queen. And I turned around and looked at him and he said, I already put a tiara on her head. Now, are are you guys, are Bob and Nell, are they here this morning or? No, okay. I I don't know. How long have they been married? 150 years? Is that right? (laughs) Come out a long time. I, I know this. Delbert and Ethel Ann, are you guys here? Where are y'all? Raise a hand. Where are y'all? Where are y'all? Del, Delbert and Ethel. There you are. Six, coming up on 60? Give them a hand. Look at that. It, it can be, those of us who've only been married 30, 40, 50 years, it can be done. All right, it can be done. We've got examples of that right here in our church. And you don't, you don't stay married that long unless you've learned how to do what this passage talks about. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Live for him, die for her. Give, giving in and giving up for each other because of what God has done through Jesus Christ for you. This passage teaches the complementary nature of marriage. It's not one's the boss and the other's the servant it's we're in this together mutually submitting to one another okay last thing earlier in the service and i appreciate the great job the smith boys did with our lord's supper meditation with the reading of this passage in john 13 we hear this story of jesus washing the disciples feet john told us something really important in verse 3 he said jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table to wash the disciples' feet. He he took on the lowest, the role of the lowest servant that there is, washing somebody else's feet, washing somebody else's dirty feet, even washing the feet of Judas, the man who was going to betray him. That gets back to this right here identity. John says he knew that he had come from God and was returning to God. I heard Paul Faulkner say years and years ago, make a brilliant observation about this passage. He said, when you know who you are, you can wash feet. Jesus knew who he was. So he didn't need to play power games. He didn't need to prove anything. 
because he knew who he was, he could submit. The word submit means to voluntarily place yourself under somebody else. The word submit changes our faith from an esoteric idea to a gritty, grace-powered way of living. That's one reason, I think, Paul spends so much time in Ephesians. And he does this in his other books as well, talking about our identity in Jesus Christ. He is trying to convince us that because of who we are in Christ, we are free from having to prove anything, freed from having to promote ourselves, freed from having to hold on to power. You know what he says about us in Ephesians? We've talked about these things. But he tells us what our identity is. He says that we are blessed. We are chosen. We are adopted, redeemed, included, raised, saved, sealed. He says that we are seated with Christ. He calls us God's masterpiece, fellow citizens, members of God's household, a holy temple, the body of Christ. He calls us children of light, God's holy people, God's dearly loved children. Look at that. That's who you are. And that's not even all of them. That's just all I can get on the page. That's the identity he has given us. And when we know that, when we really embrace and believe that, we can submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then our marriages... This is what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 5. Then our marriages become a parable of what the kingdom looks like instead of a battlefield to see who can be boss. We're going to pray over this, and then we're going to sing a song. And if you need to come forward this morning for prayer, for encouragement, for strength, for baptism, we'll have an opportunity for you to do that. You can come forward, and we'll pray over whatever you want to pray about. Okay, let's, uh, let's bow together and then we'll, let's go ahead and stand and pray and then we'll sing. Well, Father, we absolutely understand that there is a lot in your scripture that our culture doesn't understand and takes offense at because it doesn't understand. But the truth is there is a lot in your word that, that even when it is clearly understood is deeply offensive to us because we will confess to you right now that we we want to be the boss we want to have it our way and we don't mind if you're the boss in some things but there are some territories that we want to retain authority over we confess that to you and each one of us is going to have will have staked out a different territory that we want to hold the scepter over. So whatever that is, we confess it to you right now out of our hearts. And we're asking you to give us the courage and the faith and the grace to cede authority of that part of our lives back to you, back to God Almighty, because we're not doing a real good job with it. Some of us are in a real mess right now because we didn't let you be the boss. We didn't let you be the sovereign, the Lord. We did not let you have authority. We confess that. We ask you to forgive us and to clean up the messes that we have made, particularly in our marriages and our families, because that's where we make the biggest messes usually. Be our God, be our Lord, help us submit to you and to one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you need to come, you please come, we'll pray with you. Make me a servant, Lord, make me like you, for you are a servant, make me one too.
thanks for being here this morning. Again, a quick reminder. Um, as summer comes on, we have a lot of uh, different things that happen that don't happen the rest of the year. And because of that, we continue to make a big volunteer push. So I just want to mention again, as Jody did this morning, our great need for people to serve with children all over the place and in other places as well. I'm not going to tell you that our kids don't mess diapers and don't cry and they're perfect and it's an easy job because it's not and all that happens. <laughs> but that still doesn't mean that we don't need you, okay? And um, it's not just our children's ministry for the summer. We've got our Christian summer camp that needs volunteers. It starts next week. They are set up downstairs, and they need volunteers to help with those underprivileged kids that they work with throughout the entire summer. So please go down and do that. And it's our dinner in Devo. We need people to, um, to cook, to serve, and to clean up. And if you can give some time... Email Shannon at Twickenham.org, and she will put you to work. I don't want to guilt you. I off, was going to bring babies up here and just make you feel horrible because I had to take care of babies during church. But my wife didn't come through with babies. And it's not about guilt, and it's not about making you feel bad and joking about heaven and hell. Serving is beautiful. It's beautiful. So do something beautiful and serve. Thanks for being here today. We're going to close in prayer. We hope you have a great week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for another beautiful day, uh, the glory of your creation outside. Uh, Father, thank you for the time you've given us this morning to uh, hear your word proclaimed to us. Uh, Lord, just forgive us when we have uh, Burger King theology, and I just pray that you'll help us to learn how to submit to you this week, and I pray that that will uh, flow down into, uh, the more we submit to you, that it will uh, flow down into how our relationships with, uh, with the boss or with friends or a spouse or just anyone we come in contact with that that uh, that you will teach us and that that uh, you will uh, bless those relationships the more we submit to you again we thank you for the time you've given us this morning please go with us this week and just help us to be the light of christ and the the hands of christ to people we come in contact with it's in the name of jesus we pray amen